those who wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength, and they shall rise up with wings as eagles. They shall. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Raymond Melbourne Online Church. My name is Paul, and thanks for joining us this morning for church. I'm going to pray and commit our time to the Lord, and then I've got some announcements to share with everyone. So, Father, thank you for our time together this morning. We just pray that the word that is being preached this morning would really penetrate and touch everybody's hearts who's listening, and that everyone will receive a fresh word from you, that something will be highlighted from the message that would uh, speak to us all and touch our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. So some announcements. Uh, we've got our carol service coming up in, at Mill Park, Sunday the 18th of December. So we'll start off at 3 p.m. with a barbecue, and then the carol service will start at 5 p.m. So that'll be Sunday the 18th of December at our Mill Park uh, service. There'll be special songs, uh, highlights uh, with the children, singing a highlight song, lots of fun. We'll also be having Christmas hampers to give out that night as well for people in the community. So please let others know to come along um, so they, they could potentially receive a hamper from the community. So I would love to bless people. Um, so yeah, let people know about the carol service coming up. We've got Coal Stringer coming the Sunday before, Sunday the 11th of December. Uh, Coal Stringer is coming. It's going to be an awesome time. He's just a world-renowned uh, minister of the gospel. So we're really looking forward to Cole coming. He'll be at both of our services, 10 a.m. at Doncaster, 5 p.m. at Mill Park. Uh, so let everyone know about that too. It's going to be a power pack night. And then the day before that, on Saturday, the 10th of December, 9.30 to 11.30, we have a men's breakfast at the Pancake Parlor in Doncaster. Now that is required, uh, booking is required for that. So please check, text the church 0410-961-123 or you can speak to Pastor Gary if you're at church and you see him. Get your name down. Uh, men, get your name, give him your name so we can... Uh, get the numbers required uh, to let the Pancake Parlor know. So that'd be great. Also, we've got all our online programs this week. Like our Facebook page, subscribe to YouTube so you can get all the latest content that Raymond Family Church uh, Melbourne put out. We've got Eagles Prayer, 7.30 p.m. every Thursday, and also a 10 a.m. service on Sunday if you can't make it in person. But if you can make it in person, we'd love to see you at Doncaster at 10 a.m., Mill Park at 5 p.m. You can Everyone, our- my name is Ryan, and it's time for tithes and offerings. Details on how to give should be on the screen now, and they can also be found in the Rhema Family Church website. I wanted to share a personal analogy that I think represents how giving in the kingdom of God works. When I was younger, my sisters used to give junk food to me when my mum wasn't looking. They'd sneak it in because mum didn't really give us anything like that very often, so it was very exciting. Despite that, if my sister ever asked me for a chip, I would give it to her gladly. If I were to refuse, I most likely wouldn't get any more chips ever again. Being generous with my increase of chips, in in turn, opened the door to getting more chips. God operates in a similar manner. Bless others with your increase, invest in the kingdom of God, and he will bless you with even more increase. Malachi 3.10 from the New Living Translation says, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So remember, to be generous out of the goodness of your heart. Don't hoard your chips, no matter how good they taste. Put God first and he will bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all your promises. Help us to give with glad hearts that we may bless others as you bless us. Amen. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rhema Melbourne Online Church. And welcome as we continue on our series with Unfeigned Faith. This is part number six. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why I'm teaching this particular series on Unfeigned Faith is to impart and, and 
help us build a foundation of faith and understand what faith is, how it comes, how we can be effective uh, in our journey of faith with, with our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my heart's desire is for us to have breakthroughs in our lives, that if you've been dealing or facing sickness or disease uh, or financial difficulty, that uh, you'll be able to see great, awesome breakthroughs in your life. And I really believe that this teaching are keys that can really help you get some, have some breakthroughs. Amen. So let's pray. Let's commit it to the Lord. Uh, Father God, we just thank you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We commit this time to you. I commit the word to you. Commit myself to you, Father God. I pray for wisdom, revelation, eyes of our understanding to be enlightened and opened to the, the truth that's in your word pertaining to faith. Hallelujah. And how we live and walk by faith. I pray for utterance to speak it rightly, dividing the word of God accurately as I commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is uh, un unfeigned faith. Uh, uh, sorry, unshakable faith. Unshakable faith. This is part number six. So we said that um, we started off this whole teaching series by talking about Abraham, our, how Abraham uh, is the father of faith and that Abraham was fully persuaded. And that's a key scripture in Romans uh, chapter 4, verse 21, that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had said, that God was more than able to perform that in Abraham's life. And that promise was the promise of a son. And so he was fully persuaded. And so that they gave, Abraham and Sarah gave birth to that child because uh, they believed God. Hallelujah. They were fully persuaded. So we laid a foundation of what faith is, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And so faith is a persuasion. It's a conviction. So how do you know if you're in faith? How do, you, if, how do you know if you are believing and receiving? You are persuaded. You're convinced. You have confidence. You have assurance. Just like Abraham had confidence and assurance and was fully persuaded. So that you are fully persuaded that if you are believing God for healing in your body, that by his stripes you are healed. You are fully persuaded about that. Amen. And so you, re, you believe and you receive that healing. Hallelujah. So we're not talking about healing through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Many, there's different ways that you can be healed. But we're not talking about healing through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about healing, uh, divine healing through God's word. When you personally believe it for yourself. You know, it's great when, you know, ministers and pastors can lay hands on you and pray for you and you can be healed and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in manifestation. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit only operate and manifest as the Spirit wills. And, and so if, if, if there's no manifestation of the gift of the Holy Spirit, then you have to wait and for that manifestation. That's healing through uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But you can be healed directly through the word of God for yourself. Amen. You don't have to wait. You can pray. You can believe and you can receive that promise of healing in your body. When you pray, you believe that you receive that. Amen. And so faith, and so faith always takes hold of the promise. It always takes hold of the word of God. And then patience enables us to be able to stand and fight the good fight of faith and hold on 
to the promise. Example again, the promise of healing until we physically can feel, see and touch the manifestation of that healing power in our bodies. Amen. So faith always takes the promise. It always takes it, lays hold of the word of God. But patience, uh, you can hold fast without wavering with patience. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3 in the translate uh, in the passions passion translation reads this way we are grateful to god for your lives and we always pray for you for we remember before our god and father they remember before god and our father they're praying about this and they're thankful about this to the Thess Thessalonians, the Thessalonian church, how you put your faith into practice. Laying, laying hold, faith takes it. And how your love motivates you to serve. And then thirdly, how unrelenting is your hope filled patience. Isn't that powerful? How unrelenting, how uh, not yielding to doubt and unbelief, not yielding uh, to anything else, uh, but being unrelenting to hold on to the promise of your healing. Hallelujah. Amen. And how unrelenting is your hope? Your hope is future tense. You see that, that healing. It's there. You're unrelenting. You can see uh, you walking free of sickness and disease. You can see yourself walking free of debt and poverty and lack. You can see that. And so that is unrelenting, hope-filled patience. And that patience is endurance. Patience is always endurance. Remember, we said it's forbearance, fortitude. It's long-lasting, lastingness. It's perseverance. Patience is always endurance. So when you pray and believe that you receive your healing, you stand and patience enables you to be able to stand, amen, until you receive that promise, that unrelenting hope-filled patience. And then in the NIV, in verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So there certainly will be challenges to your faith. As soon as you pray, as soon as you believe that you receive, there will always be challenges. In James 1, chapter 2 through to verse 4 in the New Living Translation, it reads this way. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity. So when tests and trials comes, James says, consider this an opportunity for great joy. And why, why an opportunity for great joy? Because number one, you're going to develop patience that will enable you to stand. And the great joy is the hope that is before you, that you can see, you can see your body healed. You can see a breakthrough in that situation that even now you're standing and believing God for. You can see that breakthrough. Hallelujah. And because you can see it, there's joy in your heart. Remember, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So there's a joy and there's a peace and there's patience there in enabling you to stand and fight the good fight of faith. Consider it an opportunity of great joy right now, this trial that you're going for, through. Remember, God doesn't send tests and trials. Tests and trials comes through uh, by Satan and all his cohorts, demons, Satan and his army, Satan and his cohorts. Tests and trials c come through them. God doesn't cause them, but God permits them. Why will God allow 
uh, tests and trials in our lives because it develops patience. Remember, tests and trials develop patience and not faith. So consider it a great opportunity for joy. The joy that lays before you because there's liberty and freedom because you that lays ahead. You shall be healed because you believe that you've received now when you prayed. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. And then it says, um, it reads on, it says, uh, your endurance. Uh, for great, let me read it again. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, so patience is that endurance, the ability to stand when it's fully developed, we're developing the fruit of patience, you will be perfect and complete, nothing, uh, wanting or needing nothing. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that awesome? Then Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance. So we're running this journey of life. We're, we're on a journey, amen, in your world, in your life. And you run that race with endurance. It's a long race, so you need patience to be able to run out the distance. Hallelujah. And even if you're believing for something from the time you've prayed from to the time of the manifestation, you need to run that journey out. Hallelujah. In faith and patience. Remember, faith and patience inherit the promises of God. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the author and the developer of our faith. For the joy set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross. So he, there was joy for him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, considered him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose hope. So Jesus, the joy that was set before him, the cross, because the joy that was set before him to endure the cross and the pain and the suffering, he saw you. He saw you being liberated, being redeemed by his blood, being set free and liberated. Glory be to God. And through the promises of God, as we believe them and receive them, we are liberated and set free and made healed and we are healed and delivered. Glory be to God. Amen. So don't quit. Patience is running the race. God gave us his promise that he would do what he said. Abraham was fully persuaded that what God said, that he was more than able to do that. So God has also given his oath to his word and his promise. Now, I want you to just be aware. Listen to this as I begin to read in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verse 13 to 19. I'm going to re read it from the New Living Translation. But this is, this is powerful. I really want you to get a hold of this. And, and it says, it reads, For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. We've well covered that. You understand that now. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God himself took an oath 
in his own name, saying, so God swore and gave an oath in his own name. God in the heavens, the highest of all authorities, swore and gave an oath to Abraham, saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply you and I will multiply your descendants. That's you. So even when you take a promise of God and believe, again, we're using the example of healing today, aren't we? When you take that promise of God, when you believe that you receive, God has sworn over his word that by your stripes, that, you, that by the stripes of Jesus, his stripes, that you are healed. He swore by that. He's given his oath to perform that in your life. And he said, I will, to, and, and that swearing and that oath to bless you, spirit, soul, body, financial, social. Boy, this it, it's just so good, isn't it? What a good God. What a great and mighty God we serve. He said, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond numbers. And then Abraham waited patiently. Abraham waited patiently and he received what God had promised. So God had promised and given his oath. And so when you take God's word and you believe it and you receive it, God has swore on his word, he's given his oath to perform that promise and that word in your life. Wow, how dynamic is that? How faith building and confident building and, and how much trust we can have in our Father and in his word. Oh, glory be to God. Now let's carry on, it hasn't finished yet. Now when the people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. So the oath that God made in his word, through his promises, it is binding. That oath is binding. God has bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable. Wow. These two things, his promise, he swore an oath, they are unchangeable. It is impossible for God to lie. That's why you can be persuaded and convinced, have confidence and assurance and trust in our God, trust in his word. He is more than able to perform it. God is not a respecter of people. He, did not re he does not respect Abraham more than you. He made an, the same Abraham, the same covenant he made with Abraham is the same covenant that is made with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. God's not a respecter of people. That promise, that came to pass, that unseen promise that I will make you a father of many nations, he believed that and he received that and he gave birth to that, that promise. He gave birth to that child. Hallelujah. This is your breakthrough. These are keys for you to overcome. Amen. And, and I want you to contact us as you get breakthroughs, healings, miracles, signs, wonders. Glory be to God. Contact us. Let us know what's happening in your life. And so it said, and those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that God never changes his mind. So God has given his, both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. And then it still continues. Therefore, we who have fled to him, 
for refuge? Have you ever fled to God for refuge? Maybe you're in a situation where you fled to God for refuge. That's safety, a shelter and protection. And so um, uh, those who have fled to him for a refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope, Bible hope, uh, so hold on to this hope. That hope is an expectation that's there. That hope is an expectation that lies before us. It's future tense hope. Faith is always now. Hope is always future that lies before us. This hope, this Bible hope, is a strong and trustworthy anchor of our soul. And it leads us through the curtain into the, into the uh, inner sanctuary. And so uh, hope is an anchor for our soul. Say that with me. Hope is an anchor for our soul. So what is the soul? The mind, the will, and the emotions. So what does an anchor do on a, on a ship? It, it stops that, that, that ship or that boat from being swept away by the winds or the waves. It's not swept away or drifting. And so hope is an anchor for your soul. Glory be to God. That expectation that you can see and you know you're persuaded in your heart, faith in your heart, uh, and and you that's giving you a hope and an expectation for a manifestation of that prophet promise. Hope is an anchor for your soul. So during the time of praying that you believe that you receive, while you're standing, standing and Patience is enabling and working there, uh, the fruit of the Spirit in giving you that supernatural ability to be able to stand. Not only that, until you see the manifestation, but not only that, hope is an anchor to your soul. And it will stop your thoughts from drifting and being swept away by doubt and unbelief and bombardments of all wrong thinking or thoughts that will pull you out of faith and make you let go of that promise. But you hold fast and don't quit. So you have patience on your side while you're standing. You have hope, which is an anchor of your soul. Hallelujah. Isaiah 26.3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him, whose mind is stayed. In other words, whose mind is unmoved, not drifting or being swept away. Hallelujah. And there's peace, your mind. Uh, you will keep him. God will keep you. The word will keep you in perfect peace. Perfect peace. Where? Not just peace in your spirit. We have peace in our, in our spirit. That's a fruit of the spirit. But peace in your soul, in your thoughts, while you're standing, while you're fighting the good fight of faith, there's peace in your soul whose mind is unmoved on the promise, on the word. Hallelujah. Because he trusts in you. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. And so oath is a legal, legal and binding agreement. But God always works. And this is what, I, as we move on to a, just another, the law of faith, I want you to understand that God operates on the basis of law and principle, the principle of law. So God is a faith God. So law and principle, there is the law of faith. And so I want us to just touch on that briefly this morning. The law and the principle of something, that's truth. That serves as a foundation. That's what a law is. The principle thing. It's a truth. The truth of God's promise. The truth of God's word that serves as a foundation. That's, what, that's our foundation. 
Remember, our substance, faith is the substance. Our substance is the foundation that we're standing on. Hallelujah. Finding the good fight of faith. So that law, that law, that principal thing is the truth that serves as the foundation for a system, the system of belief and behaviour. The systems, that, that's what the a principle is and the principle of the law, a truth. God is a faith God. God is a spirit. God is a faith God. It's not possible to please God without faith. So God being a faith God, his truth, his word is faith. Faith is our foundation. Faith is the system because God is a faith God. That's the system, the system of our belief. Where do we believe? We believe in our heart. What is our heart? Our heart is our human spirit. We believe in our heart. The heart is not, we're not talking about the physical organ. The heart, the physical organ, the pumps blood around the body. We're talking about the spirit of man, the real man that's in you, that inner man. That is the heart. That's where faith resides. That's where the force and the power of faith resides, where the kingdom of heaven uh, dwells within us. Hallelujah. Where our spirit is born again. Our spirit man is born again. Glory be to God. Where you've been made a new creation in, in Christ. That's the, the, the area of, of faith where faith resides. The force of faith dwells within our spirit. And so, and so that is the, um, uh, the law, the principle that serves as the foundation of the system of belief and our behaviour. How do, how do we act? That's the system of faith. What is the behaviour of faith? How does faith act? Act. Faith acts by believing, by speaking, by sowing seed, by talking, by confession. That's the acts of the law of faith. The law of faith believes, it speaks, and there is always a corresponding physical action that corresponds with your words. If your action or if your words, if your action, what you're doing is not corresponding with your words, if you say one thing and your action does another, then it will not work. You're not applying the system of the law of faith. The law of faith, Romans 10, 9 and 10. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. That's not just uh, for the new birth or, or the saving grace of God to be saved or delivered from the kingdom of darkness and be born again. It's not just for the new birth. It's for the new birth, but it's spirit, soul. Your soul needs saving, renewing the mind, spirit, soul, body, healing in your body, being saved, spirit, soul, body, financial, in the financial realm, social realm, family, social, married life, etc., etc. All these areas. Glory be to God. And so that's why. <laughs> God is a faith God in it. That's the truth. That's the system of the belief of how we behave, how we act. So faith comes by hearing. That's a part of the system, isn't it? You've got to hear faith to believe it, to receive it. You heard about Christ. You believed it. You heard it enough time. Times Faith doesn't come just by having heard, but it comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. You heard about Christ. You believed it. You received it. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that system and behavior of that law of faith. How does it work? It works by 
by believing in our heart. You believe that he's the Christ, the son of God, and you confess him. You believe and you confess him as your Lord and as your saviour. Confession, believing is made unto righteousness. Confession was made unto salvation. So that law of faith is believing, it's speaking, and it's acting. And our words must line up with our actions. And so you cannot uh, be running around saying, well, you know, um, um, go, oh, I believe I'm healed, I'm healed. And then the next minute you're saying, oh, I'm sick, I've got pain. And all your actions of your behavior patterns contradict um, what God said that by his stripes you've, you're healed. You said, I believe I receive when I, when I pray that healing. So you've either received it or you haven't. And if you have, then you have to hold fast to your confession. Remember, Jesus is the high priest of your confession. And he's your advocate. He's your lawyer watching over your confession to perform it in your life. And so, but these are laws. And that's really what I want you to understand uh, as I'm just sharing with you about the law of faith. So God always operates by the law of principle. And we said that that, that principle is the truth that serves as a foundation for a system uh, on by uh, system uh, uh, of belief and behavior. Um, just like we could actually say, you know, no, let me start here. What is a law? A law is a predictable. A law is predictable. That when that law is put to work, it works. So we got the law of faith. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. That's the law of faith with a corresponding action. So a law is predictable. It's predictable that when that law is put to work, when you put that law of faith, any law, when you put a law into action, that law automatically will come to pass. It automatically works. And it works the same way every time. It would just be like the law, let's say the law of mathematics. Law of mathematics, five plus five equals 10. It's a law. That, that, it doesn't change. But the same law works. If you say five plus three plus two equals 10, you get the same result. When you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, uh, God's promise of what he said, when you're persuaded and convinced, and that is a sword of the spirit coming out of your mouth. Hallelujah. You have just put a law into action. And God watches over that. And, and that law will automatically come to pass because it's a law. Amen. And also, just like the law of gravity, if I take something in my hand and I drop it there, it will fall to the ground because of the force of the law of gravity. It will happen every time. Every time I let go of something from my hand, it will drop. It won't stay and hold there because it's the laws that govern that law of gravity. And so say, the same thing is with the law of faith. Uh, the law of faith. The law of lift. What does that do? The law of lift supersedes that. When we see an aeroplane in the sky flying, it's superseding the law of gravity. So the law of lift will supersede that law. And the law of faith will supersede any law the law of faith is the highest law because it's a spiritual law. It's the spiritual law of faith and it supersedes the curse. It supersedes any earthly law because the spirit, God is a spirit, created the seen world, the seen laws. Any uh, sickness and disease that comes under the laws of planet earth the law of faith supersedes that. 
Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And, and, and the law of faith supersedes the law of sickness and disease, spirit, soul, body, financial, social. Hallelujah. When you put that law to action, God swears by an oath that it's unchangeable and that that promise will come to pass. That is absolutely awesome, isn't it? Hallelujah. So uh, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 and 14, having the same spirit of faith, uh, that's human spirit, having the same human spirit of faith, spirit that's born again, according as it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken, we also believe, and therefore we speak. We speak having a spirit of faith, the same spirit of faith. A spirit of faith speaks. And also a spirit of faith is caught. It's important where you fellowship. It's important what you listen to. It's important that you hang around people that have a spirit of faith. It really is. Glory be to God. And a spirit of faith believes and it speaks. That's what a spirit of faith does. Hallelujah. Do I hear an amen? Glory be to God. <laughs> so the law of faith, Romans 10, 9 and 10, we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. We read this last week, but let's read it again. The law of faith putting it into action, what we believe, what we speak, how we act, physically act upon what we believe. Our actions um, tell us and let us know if we're believing, if we're actually in faith. Our words tell us if we are in faith and if we are believing. And if we're not, you know, some people say, well, you need to change your confession. You need to change what you're speaking. But you can't just change what you're speaking. The only way that you can change your words and your confession is by changing what you believe. And the only way you can change what you believe is by hearing and hearing the truth. And I'm sharing the truth with you this morning. So faith is coming to you. Amen so that you can apply this to your life and see awesome breakthroughs. And so as you hear what I'm sharing, you can believe that. Glory be to God. And as you believe it, your words will line up with what you, you're, you're saying. You speak what you really believe. You do. If you're speaking sickness and disease all the time continually, then that's what that's telling you what you really, really, really believe. Hallelujah. Some people say, I can't, I can't see myself, you know, living in a, a big, big house. You can't see that because you don't believe that. And if you don't believe that, you'll never receive that. You've got to get persuaded about what God said in his word for your life. Hallelujah. Where, what are you framing your world with? Remember, words frame your world. Uh, God framed the world with his words. You're framing your world with your words. And so Mark in chapter 11, we read this last week, but just reading a, a couple of other things as we uh, go through it again. And in verse 22, verse 22, Mark 11, Jesus answering said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Believe in God. Believe in your heart. Believe in your spirit. For truly I say unto you that whosoever will say to this mountain, you speak, what's your mountain? Speak to that mountain. Whoever will speak to that mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and will not doubt. So don't doubt but shall believe that the things that he said, 
The things you say will come to pass. It's the law of faith. He will have whatever he's, he says. So you'll have whatever you say. Let your words be words of life and not words of death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and we eat the fruit of them. Therefore I say unto you, what things whoever you desire, when you pray. So it's when you pray, faith is now. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. As you believe, as you speak and as you act that out. And then look at verse um, 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any. And so how important is our love walk? And so faith works by love and love works by faith. <laughs> we need both. We need love and we need faith. But if you're out of faith, if you're walking in unforgiveness, then you can never expect to put the law of faith. That will stop the law of faith from operating and coming to pass and fulfilling the promises. So you have to let go of any unforgiveness. If you've walked out of love anywhere in your journey of faith, then you need to deal with it. And you can easily deal with that by, by just um, repenting and turning from that. You just say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've been holding unforgiveness in my heart. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me of all that, that unrighteousness. And I thank you, Father God. I thank you for that, that forgiveness. You know, God forgives and forgets when you come to him. He doesn't only forgive, he forgets. If you went back to God and say, God, do you remember when he would, he'd, he'd just say, no, I don't remember. So God forgives and God forgets. And you, you have to forgive and you have to also forget. Amen. And love is a supernatural ability working on your behalf to help you forgive. But the bottom line is what we're talking about is putting the, the law of faith into action. And we don't want any hindrance to that. Amen. So thank you for joining with us today. And I've got a couple of other great things that I want to share with you next week. I can't wait to, to share some, some, some of the word and the scriptures and the things that I've, that I've got for you. So you have an awesome week. If you've never received Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you can pray, you can believe and receive him now. So just pray with me. Say, Jesus, I ask for you to be my Lord. I ask for you to be my saviour. Come into my heart. I believe and I receive you as the Christ, as my Christ, as my Lord and saviour. I believe I receive you now in Jesus' name. So if you've done that, then glory be to God. You've been delivered from a kingdom of darkness and you're on a journey of life. And so there's things that we want to encourage and send you about this new journey of life. So please let us know, contact us, and we'll send you some books and other information that we've got for you. Everybody else, you have an awesome overcoming week. And remember, put these laws of faith into operation, and you're going to see great breakthroughs in your life. So God bless. Have a great week. And remember that Jesus is Lord. And those who wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength, and they shall
shall renew.